think if I look back at my career, uh, when I was a programmer, uh, I'm very proud of, of, of launching and conceptualizing a series that HBO called Boxing After Dark. Now, I'm a little bit ups upset and, and sort of bums me out that HBO is out of the boxing business because I think I was part of a legacy there. Um, you know, we, we, we created pay-per-view boxing, really. Seth Abraham, Ross Greenberg, Mark Tappet, myself. Um, and, and I created Boxing After Dark, and there is no Boxing After Dark any longer. But what Boxing After Dark was, was a... HBO boxing was star-driven, and, and a lot of televised boxing has been star-driven. But as years uh, have passed, the majority of world champions in boxing can walk through Times Square without being recognized. And my belief was, if you make great fights, and you brand them, the fan doesn't have to know, the subscriber doesn't have to know those two fighters before the fight. If you're giving them good enough content, if two guys fight with passion, go to war, it's tremendously entertaining, people will come. And um, at the time, I went to Michael Fuchs. I went to my boss. My boss said, I like the idea. You've got to convince Michael. Michael Fuchs was, at the time, the, the chairman of HBO. And, um, and, and he loved HBO boxing. He was a real boxing fan. But he believed it was all about stars. And I sat down with him, and I said, you're, you're wrong on this one. You've got to let me do this. We'll do great ratings. We'll be able to bring down our license fees because we'll prove that we can get ratings without spending gazillions of dollars on a few of the top fighters. We can get ratings by presenting great fights. And he made a bet with me. Um, and at the time, I mean, now it's six ratings unheard of in premium cable. But at the time, you know, World Championship Boxing on HBO was doing eights, nines, and tens in terms of ratings. Um, and he said to me, well, you need, you know, I'll, I'll bet you $500 that you can't do a six rating with your premier telecast. Um, so we had a fight of the year candidate. It was fighters people hadn't heard of. They became superstars later. And it did a 6.7 rating. It took me a long time to collect for Michael. But Boxing After Dark became a staple of HBO's programming. But more importantly, it opened the door for fighters in smaller weight classes. It opened the door for great fighters that otherwise weren't getting attention. You know, fighters who were excellent, tremendous talents, but below the superstar level. And that paradigm of creating great fights and branding them became a standard all over the place in the industry. Mm -hmm. So it sort of changed televised boxing forever. And even though HBO doesn't exist any longer, I'll always be proud of that. What were the main obstacles in front of you when you had this sort of vision and you decided that this is what you wanted to do? Proving other people who were really good at what they did wrong. Okay. I mean, you know, my boss, Seth Abraham, was a great, you know, TV sports guy. Um, he believed in it, but he wasn't willing to put himself, you know, that out on it. He, he, you have to go convince my boss. And, and Michael Fuchs was a tremendous uh, programmer. Uh, I mean, he was a... He was the fearless leader of HBO at the time, but he had a great sensibility for programming. And it was, you know, really going to these guys saying, trust me enough to give it a shot. And if I fail, I fail. Mm -hmm. Well, luckily it didn't fail. If you, uh, if Boxing After Dark had never existed and you're in the same situation now, maybe you're at HBO, maybe they're still in boxing, and you are presented with this sort of challenge, right? How do we popularize boxing or how do we create something? and you have this idea for Boxing After Dark, what would you do differently now uh, that you didn't do then? The world is so different now, mm -hmm. I couldn't even answer that question. Right. See, now the challenges are completely different. Now, once again, by the way, these, the competing factions and competing television entities in boxing in the United States are going back to that star-driven mm -hmm. kind of you know, the perception of the sport as superstar driven. And the reason for that is, take the zone, they need to move subscribership. And, a, you know, one great fight doesn't move subscribership in their mind. At the moment, while they're only less than a year in, they're trying to put pay-per-view level fights that the consumer would, he was used to paying 60 or 70 or $80 to buy, putting them on the zone and hoping that it's an impetus for subscriber growth. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things the zone may be missing a little bit, and I'll discuss this with my friend Joe McKenzie, is there's a lot of good content out there. And grabbing smaller content that's high quality, it's not going to have that same, those same bursts in subscribership growth, 
but it may show the fan your commitment to the sport and encourage them to subscribe for the breadth of what you're doing within boxing, you know? Long term, do you think um, the DAZN subscriber model wins out over pay-per-view, or does pay-per-view block the progress of DAZN? Pay-per-view is not blocking the progress of anything. At the moment, pay-per-view is there for those situations where an event is capable in one night of generating more money than anyone wants to pay for it. The issue for DAZN might be how much tolerance for pain do they have as a lost leader? Would they really go out there and spend $150 million on one fight for the hope that it moves subscribership? That's an awful lot of money. Uh, you know, pay-per-view is not going to exist as we know it um, in 10 years, as we know it. That's not to say there won't be one-time transactional programming. There very well may be. But pay-per-view as we know it's not going to be the force it is now. People are going to be, it's going to be an on-demand model of television as a whole. We're just way away from that right now. You know, part of the challenge the zone has is that they're only a subscription model. They don't have a linear partner. They don't have a natural partner or, or a co-owned entity in the United States that's promoting subscribership of the zone, or that's building the brand in front of more eyeballs. You know, they're they're limited to their marketing budget in terms of developing a brand new brand. Um, I get what they're doing, and I understand that it, it, there, there is a logic to it, and, and it remains to be seen. I'm rooting for their success. Um, it would be a lot easier for them if they did have that lineal partner. Um, but I think they did. They, they are correct in, right now, given the, the sports marketplace, of identifying the combat sports as an area where they can get subscriber growth by appealing to a hardcore fan base. Mm -hmm. Ludabella, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.